All right. Huh? <laughs> well, who won the contest? The chicken? <laughs> the right man. The right man. Okay. All right, bring, go make barbecue great again. <laughs> well, you know I'm from Memphis, barbecue capital. So, but no, it was good. Everything was good. I appreciate the fellowship, and and uh, now it's just a matter of for the next couple of hours perpetrating a fraud or pretending to be awake. And uh, so, <laughs> so I hope, so I just hope I can. Uh, you know how it is with us country folks when we eat. So, um, but, I, but I thank you so much. Great fellowship today, great food, um, uh, a great offering for uh, the uh, concern, the charity, the school. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm just very, very much enlightened and blessed and impressed uh, by this congregation and and your your love for each other your camaraderie and the fact that you love the church and you love you love this place and i pray that god will continue to bless you for many many years uh for what uh to continue to do what you're doing right now we're supposed to talk this evening about becoming lights in a dark world and we might say continuing to be lights in a dark world when you're talking to the church and you're talking to christians because Lord knows it's, it's a dark world right now. There are a lot of issues that we have to deal with. There are a lot of problems that have to be dealt with. Ignorance is synonymous with darkness. So when we start talking about darkness, we're talking about ignorance. We're talking about folks going in the wrong direction, believing the wrong things, false doctrines and false ways. I tell people everywhere I go that the scriptures talk about these individuals. If there is a false prophet, there is a false prophecy. If there is a false teacher, there is a false teaching. If there is a false leader, there's a false way. And people who follow within these find themselves in darkness. They find themselves not really trying to, uh, going to where they, they believe they want to go or are attempting to go. When I, I travel, I tell folks all the time that I have no sense of direction. My wife could go anywhere and go right back to it. And so she was my, my travel companion on many uh, occasions. And so I, I, uh, I have no sense of direction. You have to tell me how to get there and then stay with me until I get there because I'll get lost uh, around the block somehow. I don't know how I became an Eagle Scout. I could use a compass, but um, without that compass, I am a lost soul. But there are a lot of folks who are lost the same way in the world. Uh, they have their moral compass does not work because it is something that we are given as a gift. Uh, we, we as Christians, you're here today because there is something that convinced you that that was a better way to live than the way you were living. For many of us, we've, we've been in the church all of our lives. I tell folk all the time about my family as I've talked about my family. It's because it's so precious to me because I know how blessed I was. Uh, I tell folks everywhere, and you probably heard this before, so you know I didn't originate it, but all the Deberry children had a drug problem. Uh, you know, we got drugged to vacation Bible school. We got drugged to night service. We got drugged to all the gospel meetings. If, if there was a gospel meeting anywhere within a 100-mile radius, we were thrown in the station wagon, and we were on the way. And, 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 you know, as children, we didn't always appreciate it. I was a grown man almost before I ever saw The Wizard of Oz all the way through. It came on at 6 o'clock on Sunday afternoon every year. And about the time we're getting into the munchkins coming out from munchkin land, it was time to go to church. And, you know, we did everything. We played sick. We begged. We did everything. <laughs> But uh, we had we were we were drugged to night service every Sunday. It, it meant a lot to to us. And when I think about what my father and my mother taught us, when I look at some of the kids I grew up with when we were in Memphis and we moved from Memphis to Crockett County, I remember when we moved. I, I left as I said last evening, and as I, I may have said this morning, we left this big beautiful church that was a lot designed just like this one. 
about 600 people in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, where Brother Yeldale at that particular time was the preacher. And we went to a small church of about 25 folks with handmade pews and handmade pulpit. Well, I had to learn real quick, and we had a culture shock as city kids. We had to learn real quick what it meant to be Christian, and to be a Christian was a whole lot different from what we thought in that big, beautiful church at that particular time because my dad had to teach us how to serve. But not just that, he taught us how to work. Uh, I drove a John Deere, my dad worked for the federal government. He was a veteran. He worked for uh, the VA. He worked for, um, um, uh, I forget what, what the agency was called, but, but he was transferred because he was a smart young man with a nice, smart young family. He was transferred to Crockett County uh, to work there. And I learned how to pick cotton, chop cotton, pick squash, peas, okra. I drove a John Deere tractor from can to can't. I, um, I was very uh, strony. I, I threw newspapers. I had my bicycle and I could fold that bad boy and I could pretty much put it right in front of your door, uh, morning and evening paper. But I really hadn't worked hard. By the time I graduated from high school, I had gone from a kid who was sick all the time, in the hospital all the time, to one who could grab a hay hook and pull a 60 pound bale of hay up to the hay loft with one hand, pick up a 60 pound bale and walk all day behind the hay baler and put it on the beller because it changed me. It changed me. It changed me physically and it changed everything about me and learning how to work in that environment and how to uh, do, the, do what I had to do for the church in that environment. The relevance of it is that uh, there are a lot of folks who saw the changes in me. They saw me grow, they saw me mature, they saw what I believed in. And several of my friends were converted simply because of the changes that happened in me. Not, you couldn't be a bad boy in my daddy's house, but the fact that I learned how to be mature in the way I presented what I believed. I was more of a light for them than I was when I, when I did not have my offense, when I walked away from it, when I wasn't uh, uh, demonstrative, when I wasn't demanding, when I didn't stand up and fight the way I was supposed to for what is right. And that don't mean in a bad way. I just stood firm on what I believed and I converted a whole lot of folks who had never been in the church before. God wants us, at the end of the day, we know God can smell the stench of sin all over America. We know that. We know that. We know that there are children who are not being raised. We know that, don't we? We know there are homes that are terrible places for women and for children and for men in America. We know that, too. We know that there is crime, that there is murder, that there is suffering, uh, that there is poverty, that there is prejudice, that there are just some plain old flat meanness out there. We know that. We have a choice. We have a choice. We can go and grovel in the darkness, find a corner somewhere, and squat down, suck our thumb, and hide. Or we can step up, stand up, walk into the light of the Lord, and allow that light to be illuminated all over our community. Those are our choices. When God created the world, the Bible lets me know very clearly, God said he made the lesser light to rule the night and the greater light to rule the day. The fact of the matter is, we, the scientists have let us know that the moon produces no light. It produces no light whatsoever. The moon reflects light. It reflects the light of the sun. When we see the moon up in the nighttime sky, it's because it is reflecting the light from the greater light that rules the day. It is reflecting the light of the sun, the S-U-N sun. We know that we're imperfect. We know that we're flawed. We know we mess up. We misspeak. How many times have you, I know I have, said, oh, wish I hadn't said that, or mm, wish I hadn't done that, or I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't have said that that way because I'm imperfect. And there are times when I allow my emotions to override. You know, somebody says you put your 
put your brain in gear before you before you put your mouth in motion and too often time we do that and and i have many times struggled trying to get my foot out of my mouth up to my knee but the fact is the fact that i am flawed is not the issue the lord is successful the lord is not flawed he never sinned he never made a mistake he provided the victory that i'm supposed to possess just as the moon reflects the light you've already figured it out of the S-U-N sun, you and I are supposed to reflect the light of the S-O-N sun. That's our responsibility. It's not, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not even about us. It's about him. And it's about him letting us know that the devil has every intent of making this world look as depressing, as disappointing, as frustrating, as disgusting, as despicable as possible. That's his job. That's what he does. That's what he's good at. He's good at discouraging people and, and dismantling them and detouring them and distracting them. That's what he's good at. Our job is to go and to show them the way. I was traveling um, one night on 40 going toward Nashville, and there had been a great uh, a bit of rain. And I'm going still probably maybe 35, 40, 50 miles an hour in that rain because I could see pretty well. And there, all of a sudden, there was a great flash of light like this, like somebody trying to stop me. And, you know, when somebody's trying to stop you on the highway, you think, and, you, uh, you know, should I stop? Thank goodness I, I stopped because they were flashing me. It turned out to be a state trooper. And there's this huge sinkhole that has come in the highway that if I had kept on going without that warning and without that person standing there with that light, I would have been in that hole and probably would have died that night because I would have probably gone first face down in it. And while it may not have been more than six, seven, eight feet deep, it was deep enough for water to drown me if I had gone face first, and especially if I couldn't have gotten out of the seatbelt or something. The fact is, that light and that messenger stopped me from hurting myself. That's what the Lord tells us to do. It's not about us going out making folks know how perfect we are. It is about us letting them know how perfect he is. And I wrap myself in the image of Christ. That's what I do. I wrap myself in the image of Christ, and then people can see the light because they see it in me. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 5. You also, ye also, as lively stones, are built upon a a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What's my job? My job is to let folks see Jesus. Let them see Jesus. How? By the light that I shine, by the way that I live, by the way that I speak, by the way that I carry myself. When the Lord said you are the light of the world, he's not saying you are the perfect people of the earth. What he's saying is you are the folks who are following in my footsteps, which automatically makes you better than the rest of the folks in the world. And, and we, we got to get rid of this inferiority complex that we have as Christians, to where we act like folks in the world are smarter than we are, they're prettier than we are, they have more fun than we do, they get richer than we are. That's, that's garbage. That's garbage. I mean, you get rid of that. All that stuff, that inferiority complex dulls our light. It dulls our light because it puts a frown where a small smile ought to be and a scowl where a confident look ought to be. We, we need to present that aura of confidence and victory and not that of victims. We're not victims. How are we victims if Jesus saved us? How in the world are we victims if he provided salvation for us? When I was, and, and you may have heard the story at the uh, encampment, but when I, uh, I, I did a gospel meeting in Florida somewhere near the ocean, and my, my youngest daughter, her name is Christy, 
Christy at that particular time uh, was just a, was just a little girl, and and she was about nine. She'd never seen the ocean. Uh, she'd seen the Mississippi River, but you know you're up on the hill looking down at the river, but she'd never seen the ocean on a level where she's walking on the beach, and there's this huge body of water that you can't even see the horizon. So she's holding on to me for dear life. I'm trying to walk, and I'm dragging Christy, trying to walk across the beach. I'm dragging a pharaoh in the sand. I said, Christy, let go. It's okay. And she said, no, no. Uh -uh. She was not letting go. I said, let go, Christy. You're, you're going to be fine. And she would not let go. And after a while, I said, look, here's Christy do this. I said, I, just follow me. Wherever I walk, you just walk behind me, and you're going to be just fine. So finally got her to let go. And so I'm walking down the beach with my pants rolled up, enjoying the beach and looking around. And I look back, and Christy was walking literally in my footprints. Wherever my footprint was, she hadn't, she hadn't paid any attention to the ocean. She is watching my footprints and walking in my footprints. True story. And, and I thought about that, and I've talked about that for the last 20-something years because I said, boy, what a perfect example of what Christ told us to do. Perfect example. He says, I, came, I became a person. I became a man. I put on the flesh. In due season, in due time, Christ became a man. He, was, he came through the flesh of a young woman, 14 years old or, or somewhere right around in there, and he became a man. He put up with everything we complain about. Jesus was born in, in poverty, what would consider, be considered. His dad was a working guy. We, we don't need to act as though Jesus was around begging bread. He was, and he had a good daddy and a good mama, and he was a well-fed young man, brought up and taught an apprentice by his father, who was a carpenter, and his mama, who was an attentive woman, I'm sure, who made sure that they ate their meals at the appropriate time. And what Jesus did was he dealt with folks talking about him, calling him ignorant, unlearned. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Man, you don't even know who your mama is. They even talked about his mama. And what did Jesus do? What Jesus did was teach us how to be a light how to be a light because at the end of the day when the pharisees got through talking about him and the sadducees finished making accusations and the high priest and others the scribes finished testing him and being unable to trip him up or cause call him a blasphemer at the end of the day the bible says the common people heard him gladly jesus the bible says had compassion and everywhere we look, we see people following this young man. We see one woman dragging with her last ability and strength, saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Jesus had shined the type of light, this type of reputation, where this woman who had spent every dime she had in trying to deal with her issue, looked at Jesus as the only hope that she had to where if I died trying to take, touch his garment, at least I died trying to get to the solution. And when Jesus felt virtue leave his body, he said, who touched me? Who touched me? Meaning he's attuned to every one of us. He turns to this woman and praises her faith. The Lord ought to say to all of us, who touched me? Because in the midst of this darkness, we're reaching from the murky darkness that stifles us. And we're reaching for his perfection so that we can shine light in the world in which we live. He said there in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And the Lord wants us to be the type of people who make sure that we don't... Um, uh, take our light, and he says, and put it under a bushel. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't dumb yourself down for other people. We have a tendency of dumbing ourselves down, and we don't want to, we're not going to offend people. When the apostles came to the Lord one time and said, Lord, <laughs> you know, you did some good preaching today, Lord. Yeah, man, I tell you, he sure did, didn't he, Peter? Yeah, he did some good preaching today. Uh, but Lord, did you know that the Pharisees were offended by your preaching? 
Now, can you imagine the look the Lord probably gave them? Can you go back 2,000 years, use human nature, and someone with the personality of Christ who is strong, who is doing his Father's will, who has sacrificed to become a man, is hot, he's been walking, he's tired, he's been dealing with fools all day, and here you come and say, they were offended? You know what the Lord said to them? He said, you leave them alone. In other words, you need to get out of their faces. Why are you standing around talking to people who are talking about me? Why are you talking to people who are talking about me? How much time do we give folks that we shouldn't give a hot second, as my grandma used to say? How much time do we give people who are talking us down, talking the church down, talking the scriptures down, talking down our preachers and our elders. You know, for some folks, the only the uh, thing they enjoy at home, and, and we wonder why some children grow up and they don't have the proper appreciation for the leadership in the church. I mean, if they grow up on stewed elders and barbecued deacons and, and the French fried preachers, they're not going to have the, the proper attitude. Now, why do we give, give the devil so much time? She said, leave them alone. Get out of their faces. They're blind. The folks that follow them are blind. And what's going to happen if they don't change and the people who follow them don't change, all of them are going to face the consequences of their behavior. They're going to all fall into the ditch. That's what Jesus wanted them to know. Basically, you need to avoid the ditch that they are going to fall in and follow me. Uh, as as the light. Let me let me put this to you as we talk about being the light. Look at Titus chapter three and verses one. We've already quoted verses 11 and verses 12, where he talks about the grace of God that brings salvation. But look at what Paul said as he left Titus at Crete. He had left Titus at Crete. He had left um, he had left Timothy at Ephesus. And both of those young men has a tremendous job that they've got to perform in being a light in these places that needed the organization of the truth. Paul said, put them in mind. Get their minds right. When, when he says, remember when he says, looking unto Jesus, the Hebrew writer said, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus means take your eyes off of this and turn and look at Jesus. How many folks are looking we're looking at what the Supreme Court did, rightly so, but we're looking at what the president's doing, what the Congress is doing. What the Lord says, you need to take your eyes off them. Look unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the pioneer, the one who showed us how to do it, the one who, who made the footprints in the sand. Turn from these folks who are walking toward the ditch, these fools, and the Bible says, the fool has said what? In his heart, there is no God. Turn your eyes off of these fools. And it doesn't matter what prefixes and suffixes are on their name. It doesn't matter how big their office might be or whatever the shape of it might be. It doesn't matter. According to God, they are fools. So I turn my eyes off of them, put the darkness behind me, and I follow the light of Jesus. This is what we've got to do. And while we're doing that, Peter gives us a prescription of living in a world of darkness, knowing that God, Romans 13, ordains all authority, and obviously god got a reason for doing what he's doing. What do I do? Paul told Titus, put the church in mind, because he left them at Crete to preach at the churches. Put the church in mind to be subject to principalities, Pay your taxes, obey the law, stop at the stop signs, uh, uh, don't break the law, don't steal, don't kill, don't do anything that's an ordinance of the city that would put you in at variance so they could say you're a Christian, but you're still a lawbreaker. You're still a lawbreaker. You, didn't, I saw, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do the things that citizens ought to do. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, obey the law, and be ready to every good works. Whatever you can do to be a light in the community, you do it. So folks can see the difference between the holy and the profane. 
We don't want to get into the murky darkness where folks can't tell us from everybody else. That's not who we want to be. I was on an airplane coming, coming here yesterday. And I was sitting beside a gentleman. And every now and then I, was, I, I sat there and I, I kind of opened my book and I was going through my book. Um, I had my Bible there in front of me. And, you know, and I was just reading. And at, at a certain point he said, excuse me, sir. I said, yes, sir. He says, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. He says, I could tell. And I didn't, he said, and here's what he said. He says, when you get to your church, because he asked me, what was I going to Detroit for? I said, I'm going uh, to a congregation in Detroit. I'm going to work for, with them for a couple of days. And um, uh, then I'll be back in Memphis because he said he lived up here. And he was telling me he was an engineer and things. He said, tell the church that I could tell the difference. Oh, I said, well, thank you, sir. He said, he wanted me to tell, so I'm telling you. He told me to tell the church that he could tell the difference. When people see you, and here's, we got to get rid of this identity crisis. When you walk into a room, the light ought to come on. It ought to come on. When I go into the meeting rooms at the Capitol, when I go into Legislative Plaza, I sit on education, I sit on health, and I sit on the Children's Committee. I used to chair the Children uh, and Family uh, Committee. But when I walk in, Folks look and they start whispering because they know that whatever their plan was and whatever it was they wanted to sneak through and whatever little rotten change or amendment they wanted to put on the law, they got to wait till I'm not there. And I can always tell. I can always tell. When I raise my hand up sometime, I, when I see the chairman go, That means he knows that I'm getting ready to tear your playhouse down because I'm going to speak uh, what I'm supposed to speak. We, 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 we have that aura about us, and that's, that's shining a light. We don't turn over cars. We don't break out windows. We don't uh, take our shirts off and jump in front of the camera and throw obscene signs. We don't walk around talking about one side, one life matters and another life don't matter. And, you know, we, we know that America is built on revolution and civil, civil uh, protest. That's, you know, we started with the Tea Party back in the day in the Revolutionary War. So it's kind of part of us as Americans to rebel. I understand that. But our rebellion has always been the type of rebellion that pushed us toward what was right, not pushing us toward what is wrong. Now we're rebelling against the very principles that the nation is built upon. So that means that we must shine the light. Paul, uh, Peter, uh, yeah, Paul, in verses two, look at what he said. We don't, we don't do those things. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawler, be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. What is, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying to uh, Titus, as he wants him to say to the brethren, uh, we don't participate in stuff that makes the Lord look bad. If it makes the Lord look bad, if it makes the church look bad. My daddy once said to me, he said, Nick, uh, you're not telling the truth, are you? Um, I wasn't. I said, um, Yes, I am. He said, no. He said, you're telling one of those round lies. You don't know where that lie starts. You don't know where that lie ends. And, and, and you know, he had me. He had me. And he didn't punish me. There are several times when my parents didn't punish me that scared me half to death. This was one of those times. He says, you're making me look bad. He says, you wear my name. I gave you my name, and you're hurting my name. That's all he had to say. That stayed with me the rest of my life. I'm hurting his name. Now think about it. We say we are Christians. We take the name of Christ on us, don't we? We can't go out and hurt the Lord's name. So we got to be different from everybody. Even when we're hurt, 
we still take the high road. The Lord, I told you earlier, the Lord didn't need Peter slinging a sword. Peter was a fisherman. Lord, said, put that thing down before you kill somebody and they kill you. You don't even know what you're doing. Had to pick up the man's ear and put the man's ear back on. What the Lord needed, as the brethren, as we talked last evening, the Lord needed Peter to stand there unafraid, drop his hands, look those Roman soldiers in the eye and say, we're not scared of you. No matter what you do, we're not afraid of you. We're not going to stop preaching. We're not going to stop teaching. And we're not going to stop holding up the Lord's name. We're not scared of you. Nothing frightens a bully more than you not being scared of him. And this world right now that's telling us how we better live and that we're on the wrong side of history, they're a bunch of bullies. They want to call us bullies because we speak the truth. The real bullies are people who tell you you don't have a right to think and to be what you want to be. That's the real bully. The real bully is the person who tell you because I don't agree with you that there's something wrong with me because I don't agree with you. And you got the media now that calls us all. I've been called everything but a child of God because I don't agree with what they say. And, and they want us to compromise and capitulate. Christy, one time, I tell you stories about my children all the time. When she was in preschool, and she just graduated, I told you, from Ole Miss. When she was in preschool, my wife and I went to pick up Christy. Christy got in the car. Boy, she smelled like who did it and what for. And, and, and she sat down in the car, and her mama said, Christy, what have y'all been doing? She said, we've just been playing. I said, baby, good gracious, we got to get you home so you can get you a shower. She said, oh, that's okay, Daddy. Everybody in my class stinks. So it, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Everybody stinks. Everybody in my class stinks. And so don't you realize and understand that what folks want us to do is the same thing. They want us to capitulate, and they want us to compromise uh, when, it, when the time comes. We are to be light. We don't walk in the darkness. Turn with me, if you will, before we go to our other slides. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And I want you to notice verses 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is no compromise. What, what folks want us to say is, okay, well, maybe, maybe there are some people who God kind of messed up on in the design and he didn't quite make them right and wire them right and fix them right. And maybe God did send some people who have an affinity and an attraction toward the same sex. But he didn't do a lot of them, and we, 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 we're just going to, and we don't need to push this very much. That's what they want us to say. They want us to say that maybe we have been too hard on our children. Maybe we shouldn't force them into religion. Maybe we shouldn't make them go to church. Maybe we have been too narrow-minded about the Bible. Perhaps there are some other religious documents that are equivalent to or on the same level as the Bible, and we need to give them the proper respect also. That's what they want us to do. And they say, go along and get along. Don't shake the tree. Don't rock the boat. Just play the game. Y'all just go on and play the game. We'll leave you alone if, if you leave us alone. But well, we can't do that. We can't do that. Here's the problem. Light destroys darkness wherever it goes. You can get, what's the largest stadium in this area? University of Michigan. University of Michigan? You go to University of Michigan. Turn off all the lights, street lights, all the lights in the stadium. Turn everything black, dark, to where you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Take a flashlight and lead the preacher out to the middle. Then turn the flashlight off. You can't even see him. He go in his pocket, pull out a box, strike one match. One match. What's going to happen? You can see it from wherever you are in that stadium. You can see that one match. 
That's who you are. You're that one match. They want to tell you, well, you're just one person. You know I am. I'm just one match of light. When I shine the light, wherever I am, it destroys darkness. Wherever we are, it destroys darkness. John went on to say in the very next verse there, John said in verses 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what do we do? He said, you're not telling the truth. You're lying and do not the truth. There is no way in the world that you can walk with the devil and the Lord and let the devil live. The Lord says, I'm not going to live in a tenement with the devil. I, if, if you're going to turn your body into a duplex and you're going to put me on one side and the devil on the other side, he said, I'm moving out. It's just that simple. There, if we're, I'm not going to live where he lives. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. First of all, we can get along and encourage and edify one another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sins. And if for some reason we don't believe we need that, then we have lost it. It says, if, if uh, uh, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let's go to this slide right quick. Let's go through a few things. Here's what the world wants. The world wants to put us in a state of conflict where we are constantly wrestling with ourselves. When the Lord told us to be a light, don't put your light under a bushel and telling you to compromise. A conflict is a disagreement through which the parties involved perceive threat to their needs, interests, and concerns. Disagreements, parties involved, perceived threat, needs. Let's move pretty fast on through this. Conflict is a normal part of human existence. All unity is not good unity. All unity is not good unity. If, if we are walking with the world and agreeing with them, and compromising just so that we're not in conflict. The Lord wants us in conflict. The Lord's church is a creature of conflict. It is a creature of, of disagreement for, from, the, from the norm and the regular. You got this controversial leader. It's a child of controversy. You got this controversial leader. He has a controversial doctrine. He's got a controversial lifestyle that he's telling folks, a new type of morality, and folks want it gone. They want it dead. And I tell you, you know, in the book of Acts, they called them troublemakers, didn't they? Troublemakers. They said those folks who have turned the world upside down have come here. They're creating conflict and problem. Well, uh, conflict is a normal part of human existence. No two people, regardless of the relationship, will agree on everything. We got to understand that among ourselves, there's got to be unity. We deal with conflict one way in the church and another way outside the church. Let's go on to the next one. There is no such thing as an effective organization without conflict. When we start talking about the Lord's church, we solve our conflicts by going to the scriptures and doing what the Lord tells us to do. Go to the next one. Most of the time, our perspective of an issue and the severity of the conflict depends upon where you're sitting. If I'm sitting in the world, oh, I'm, I'm, I walked outside the line again. I'm sorry. I apologize. When, if I'm sitting and I'm trying to defend same-sex marriage, I'm trying to defend abortion. I am attempting to defend denominationalism. I am attempting to defend pluralism. I am attempting to defend a, a, uh, the Supreme Court's decisions after the people have voted and given their, their opinion and they have voted something down and the Supreme Court says, no, I, we will not recognize the vote because it's unconstitutional. If I'm attempting to defend this, I'm going to have a problem because I'm sitting in a position. Everybody has an opinion. You got an opinion. I got an opinion. All God's children got an opinion. But do you have an argument? You may not have an argument. You may have an opinion, but you don't have an argument. And many times there are folks who will sit in a chair where they have an opinion. They don't have an argument and they get angry at you. They say there's something wrong with you that you are pushing your opinion off on them. No, the difference is we can open the Bible and by book, chapter and verse, 
we can show what God's system of morality and integrity is, and they can not. Uh, go on to the next one. Some people just love to keep stuff going. I was um, uh, at, in the plaza. Fella come in and say, uh, you're John D. Bear, aren't you? Say, yeah. Say, you're a Campbellite, aren't you? I say, a Campbellite? Uh, you mean a member of the church? Yeah, yeah, a Campbellite. I say, well, yeah, I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Yeah, yeah, y'all y'all something else, man. Y'all funny. Y'all funny. You know, y'all y'all the only ones going to heaven, right? <laughs> I said, uh, I don't know. Are you going? Uh, oh, I, I said, you don't believe that your, your church is right? He says, well, well, yeah. I say, so you you don't believe that your church is the only church that's right? Well, you know, we believe that. Uh, I said, why are you at your church? Uh, because I believe it's right. So it's okay for you to believe your church is right, but it's not okay for me to believe my church is right. I, I, I stuff it back down the throat. I do. I stuff it back down the throat. I'm not going to stand there and be your whooping boy because you don't know the Bible and you're wretched and sorry and crazy and you want somebody to beat up on and I'm just convenient. And we've done that for too long. We've been everybody's convenient target just because they want to get something going. When you uh, uh, conflict, the stage of a conflict is choosing sides. Now, a lot of this I use in corporate, uh, the corporate world and telling folks on how to solve problems so they don't tear the company up. But remember something. Joshua said something to the children of Israel. What's wrong with a lot of us? A lot of reasons why we can't shine the light we ought to is because we haven't chosen sides yet. We haven't chosen sides. Joshua said to the children of Israel, if it seem evil for you to serve the Lord, choose. He said, didn't he say it? Choose, 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 choose. When? This day, right now. Choose who you will serve. And he, went, and he gave them their choices, the gods where they were, the God who brought them out of Egypt. But then he makes a statement, I've already chosen sides. As for me and my house, what are we going to do? Every one of us need to make that same, I have chosen sides. In Revelation chapter 3, the Lord said to one of the churches, he says, y'all make me sick. You're neither hot nor cold. You haven't chosen sides. We got too many people in the Lord's church who haven't chosen sides. We got just kind of like a leaf on the water, just going along to get along. And hey, it's not my battle, and it's not my fault. Choose sides. Choose sides. Moses said, "Who's on the Lord's side?" And I think Jesus said, "No man can serve how many masters." Two masters. He said, now you're going to adore one and you're going to hate the other. But you got to make a decision because you can't serve both of them. At some point in time, we have to choose sides. The Lord told that church, he says, you make me sick because you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm and I will spew you out of my mouth. From the Greek, the Lord is saying, you make me vomit. And that's an involuntary process. If you've got something in your stomach that's not supposed to be there, God has wired our brain to say, get that out of there, because if you don't get it out, they're going to be a whole lot sicker than they are now. So God makes us sick enough for our body to just brace. When a person is, I know it's not a pretty sight, but when a person is vomiting, it's a jet. It comes. You can't stop it. Your body says, get ready, hold on, because here it comes. And you just... There it is until it's done. Why? Because it's involuntary. You can't stop it. And what the Lord is saying is, y'all make me sick. I can't keep you down if I tried. I can't, I can't approve you if I tried. You make me spew you out. Every one of us have got to choose sides because the Lord wants us to be a light and he does not want us to walk in darkness. One side is a chosen. Sometimes people love a, a good fight to watch you and I as God's people. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't fight. We don't stand up and cuss foot for foot. One fellow came up one time and he was he had approached the guy who had voted against this bill. And I was coming out of the uh, 
the meeting room, and heading back to my office. Oh, man, he was standing there cussing. He was going up one side, this fella, and down the other side and starting over again, jumping down his throat, tap dancing on his liver and his kidney, crawling back out, getting back in his face, cussing again. And then he, and he, and mid, mid cuss word, he looks at me and I'm standing there looking at him like, I thought you had more sense than that. I mean, you know, I really thought he had some class and I'm listening at this and I'm standing there in shock and he looks at me and says, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, pardon me, preacher. Uh, Pardon my French. I said, French, man, that sounds like cussing to me. <laughs> that that, that sound like no, any French sound like cussing. Uh, folks, uh, you got to realize something. People from time to time allow themselves to get caught up to where they don't think like they ought to think. Power, pleasure, prestige, position, and possession. The devil intends to dangle stuff in your face so that you don't choose sides and so that you don't shine your light, that you put that bushel on so that you're not so distinguishable in a world that's walking in darkness because wherever you go as a Christian, you're shining light. And the Lord says a lot of folks want to want to dumb it down. You know, like putting a shade on a bulb. You want to dumb it down so you don't you're not so unique or distinguishable and so specific in what you believe. And that's what the devil wants us to do so that we can have stuff. In the book of Revelation, in the apocalyptic language that was sent to the seven churches in Roman Asia Minor, he spoke of one of the five beasts uh, and those that bear the mark of the beast, those that sold out. And the Satan wants to know, what's the price of your sellout? What do I have to pay you so you're shut up? Stop talking about Jesus. What do I have to give you so that you stop going to church? Stop raising your children the way you're raising. What, what's, what's the price of your sellout? And the devil wants to know. This is why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 that he said, Finally, brethren, brethren, let's look at it. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against what? The wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? The devil's trying to figure you out. How do I get in his head? How do I get in her head? How do I stop them from talking about Jesus? How do I stop them from living such a good life to where everybody else is saying, I want to be just like her. I want to be just like them. How can I figure it out and get them off their game? How am I doing on time? I'm okay. Okay, and get them off their game. And that's what the devil wants to do. Uh, go on to the next one. Go on to the next one. Go ahead. No, let's, let, yeah, let's just stay right there. One of the things that God wants us to do as we deal with other people, be aware of them, their emotions, their concerns, their needs, their attitude. What is it they want and how do they see me? I want folks to see me as a child of God. Here's what the devil says in babbling. God is wrong and mean. God takes pleasure in people's destruction. God is unforgiving and unfair. God is prejudiced and unjust. God is heavy handed and unmercy. God is therefore a fraudulent myth and the Bible an irrelevant Bronze Age book. Now that's what folks got out there in their heads. It's on TV, the talk show host, all the famous people, politicians, are bombarding people with that foolishness. Now, here we come trying to tell people that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and to shine a light so that they will see uh, out of the darkness. And we're trying to do everything we can to save them uh, from their sins because man has packaged, homogenized, and pasteurized and given sin a new name. Man will call sin an accident. God calls sin an abomination. Man will call sin blunder. God calls it blindness. Man calls sin choice, chance. God calls it choice. Man calls sin fascination. God calls it fatality. Man calls sin infirmity. God calls sin iniquity. 
Men call sin luxury. If you can afford it, do it. God calls sin lawlessness. Men call sin trifle. God calls it tragedy. Men call it weakness. God calls it wickedness. In the end, our job is to shine the light in the midst of the darkness so that men and women understand that when God comes back to judge the world, when the Lord comes back to take folks home to heaven, it's what God calls sin that stands and not what man calls sin. So our job is to shine a light on the lies, the half-truths, and the false doctrines that men will bring before folks so that they can mislead them, misguide them, and cause them to falter and cause them to sin. I want you to notice something. Romans chapter 13 and verses 12. Romans chapter 13 and verses 12. As the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Rome in the book that changed the world, Paul said in verses 12, I'll start at verses 11, and that knowing the time that now is high time to awake, to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. When I was a boy, my big papa, Brother Garrett, uh, he and Mary Garrett, his wife, had been the children of slaves. And they had come to Memphis, Tennessee. They had bought property. He had built a house. The, the kitchen was kind of crooked, and, but, but it was Big Mama's house, and she loved that house, and she kept it beautiful. And he would add on to it and add on to it. And so it was a big, weird house because he'd added so much. So when he died, I stayed with her a lot. And when she turned the lights off and I was young, all those monsters start coming out of that house from under her bed, from out of the closet. Monsters were everywhere. And she would hear me holler over there and turn the light on and say, Nick, what's wrong? And I said, Big Mama, these monsters are in this room. She said, Nick, there's no monsters in this room. She turned the light off. The monsters come back out after me. Those monsters were all in my bed, shaking my bed and scaring me to death. She turned the light on. Nick, what's wrong with you? I said, Big Mama, these monsters are in this room. She said, there's no monsters in this room. You could not have convinced me as a five-year-old child that there weren't monsters in that room. I know I saw some monsters in that room. But it was all in my imagination. I perceived a danger that did not exist. If the Lord tells you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, how in the world are we afraid of anybody? And why can't we turn our light on regardless of what they say? Why can't I live right regardless of what they say? I'm going to stop here in just a moment, but I want to tell you this. Jerry Clower once told a story, and he was funny. Some of y'all may know who Jerry Clower is. But Jerry Clower said he was in the country and that there was a fella down the street, Bubba and Clem. And both of them are hardworking old country boys, been plowing all day, go home, kick the boots off and put the hand in the overalls and kind of sit on the porch and feel, feel the cool breeze like a whole lot of the guys that I grew up with. And said that Clem down the road had his old hound dog, ooh, ooh, dog just howling and crying and howling and crying. Bubba trying to catch a nap before supper. Finally, he got up about a half mile down the road, didn't even put his boots on, walked down the dirt road, said, Clem, what's wrong with your dog? Clem said, oh, ain't nothing wrong with him. So well, why ain't making all this noise? It's all, oh, he fine. He just sitting on the night, yo. <laughs> so sitting on a nail, yo. Then why don't he get off her? He'll get off her. It ain't hurting him bad enough yet. <laughs> so how long have we been howling in America? How long have we been howling? Oh, about our children. Oh, about our homes, our schools, our communities. How long have we been howling? and howling and howling and howling in America. 
must not be hurting us bad enough yet. Is it hurting us bad enough yet to be a light? Is it hurting us bad enough yet to say that's enough? Is it hurting us bad enough yet to send some no-count jokers home from public office? Is it hurting us bad enough yet to maybe pick up a pen and write some letters? Is it hurting us bad enough yet to be the difference between the holy and the profane? That's what the Lord is saying to us. It's not rocket science. What the Lord is saying, you take control of the only thing you own. You don't own this stuff. This stuff will be dissolved, according to Peter. And the Lord said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. You don't own this body. This body belongs to the Lord. It came from the earth he created. He says it returns to the dust from which it came. You don't own the animating spirit that was breathed into this body to make it come alive. It returns to God who gave it. The only thing I own is my record. That's all I own. My record. My soul. My record. And when the Lord comes back again, he's going to look at every one of our records. All we got to do is be obedient. He didn't ask us to be extraordinary. He didn't ask us to be superstars. He didn't ask us to be great. He didn't ask us to be on billboards or on networks. Or on All he asked us to do as one person, you obey me without fear, without compromise, and with courage and character. That's all he wants from you. That's all he wants. He says, if every one of you do this, if every one of you do this, that's a whole bunch of matches in a dark world. And that's what the Lord wants us to be. Let's stop making the job impossible. It's not. Raise your children. Teach your grandchildren. Love your husband. Love your wife. Come to church. Preach the gospel. Save the folks you meet. Let people see the difference between you and the rest of the world. And the Lord say, I'll do the rest. I'll do the rest. You do your part. I'll do my part. So I want you to think about that. Thanks for listening.